All right, it's 4.30. Should we start? You guys ready? You excited? All right, I need some enthusiasm. Otherwise, I'll fall asleep. There we go. Thank you. Jeez. All right, cool. So welcome to uh, cross-platform mobile development on open source. I'm not sure if you, uh, yeah, I'm not sure why you're here, but I hope to make this as interesting and, and fun as possible. I'm sure some of you were kind of curious when you looked at the bio and it said John Wargo, freelance writer. Like, why would I care what a freelance writer has to say about open source? I'll, I'll prove to you in a minute that it might be worthwhile. It might not. Who knows? Um, like I said at the beginning before some of you got here, I, there's actually 60 slides. So this is going to be a lot of stuff real fast. I'm just going to blow through this. I presented last year on Cordova, Apache Cordova. And this year when they asked me to come back, they said, you know, can you, can you present on something else? I'm like, well, there's some alternative approaches. How about I talk about those? And they said, great, good idea. So I wrote this abstract that kind of describes it. And basically, I want to talk about Cordova, because that's what I know the best. And then I want to talk about some other approaches to hybrid development, or, well, I don't call them hybrid, but other approaches to developing mobile apps in a cross-platform way with open source stuff. And so I started putting all my material together. And then I realized that the session is only 45 minutes long, uh, which is way too short for all that material. So anyways, a little bit about me. A professional software developer for 30 years. Uh, last year, when I was here, I was a principal analyst at Forrester Research. So I have a lot of experience with enterprise development, spent the last 10 years in mobile development. I'm currently seeking full-time employment, just in case anybody's interested, which is why I'm a freelance writer. And uh, I used to be a contributor to the Apache Cordova project. I'm still involved a little bit here and there. I'll explain why in a moment. Lately, I've been doing uh, mostly stuff on IoT. Uh, currently, I'm actually working for Microsoft. I'm a contractor to Microsoft, and I'm working on the documentation for the next version of their Taco tools, which is their tools for Apache Cordova. So anyways, um, I've written a few books. I wrote the first book on BlackBerry development. I wrote uh, one of the first books on PhoneGap. Uh, and this was actually the best-selling book on PhoneGap. It was actually translated into, I think this is Chinese. This is Korean. It's kind of cool. I wrote Apache Cordova 3 programming, Apache Cordova, F Apache Cordova API cookbook, Apache Cordova 4 programming. Um, I also wrote a whole bunch of articles how to mobilize IBM Lotus Notes and Domino and they published it into Anthology. And I'm also the only do, uh, writer who's ever written a book on soccer officiating and mobile development at the same time. <laughs> if you draw the Venn diagram, I'm the guy right there in the middle. So what I want to do is I want to chat about mobile development briefly. Everyone that does a session like this always starts about how hard it is to do mobile development. And I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do it like in 14 seconds instead of the 10 minutes it normally takes. I want to talk about hybrid, talk about the problems with hybrid development, talk about the evolution of hybrid development, and then talk about some technologies, all of which are open source, all of which are free, all of which are really, really freaking cool. Can I say freaking at a presentation? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So let's start talking about mobile development. Mobile development's hard. Are we done? Um, you know, no common language across platforms. There's no single IDE. You're forced to use um, the vendor's product, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it can be really hard to be an expert on more than one platform, right? You guys all know that. Um, requires a Macintosh computer. And when I was at SAP, it was really funny because people started hammering us. It's like, oh, that, that Macintosh requirement, you guys need to fix that. Yeah, no, can't fix that problem, okay? Um, but there's, over the years, there's been a lot of really expensive solutions to cross-platform development. I used to work for AT&T selling mobile application platforms. And these guys charged, thanks for coming, they charged... Um, a million dollars for a project to build a cross-platform app, and the apps weren't any good, right? Well, since then, things have kind of got fixed. That's what we want to talk about. Um, mobile is also expensive in that fickle users are forcing developers to add more and more features, and it's a faster and faster pace, OK? And then the direct impact to that is you have to implement some sort of continuous integration so you can test your, so you can complete your builds whenever the developer's checking code. Then you have to set up some sort of automated testing because manual testing of mobile phones doesn't happen anymore. I mean, how often do you have fingers touching glass anymore, right? It's all automated. That drives something that I, I call testing never ends, right? Because of CI, because of all automated testing, testing is a nonstop process. And then, honestly, there's more to test than just whether the code works or not, right? So I want to. I want to test, I'm going to do unit tests. I want to do functional tests. But I also have to do performance testing and other things. And essentially, I have to make sure I have some sort of device farm so I can test that application on the thousands of devices that are out there. Okay. What was interesting was I used to work with testing vendors uh, when I was at Forrester. I wrote some reports about mobile app testing. And every 
vendor we talked to would grab the uh, U.S. Airways, or no, the um, Southwest Airlines app and run it through their test suite. And some of the stuff is really cool where you'd see, you know, 1,400 screenshots of all these different devices and how the app looks on it. So anyways, mobile is hard and expensive, cross-platform is the way to go, and um, that's what we're going to talk about today. So when you look at the, pro the approaches for mobile app development, um, some of these you probably recognize web and native, hybrid, the Apache Cordova thing. I actually coined a couple phrases, JavaScript driven native and adjacent native, that describe uh, really the two topics we're going to talk about today. And then there's also mobile application development platforms, but they're, they're useful, but they're losing some of their momentum uh, just because of the cost and so on. Well, actually, they've shifted from being super expensive, big monolithic cross-platform development products to being platforms that allow you to quickly and easily get something out there and build some pretty compelling apps. But the pricing model has changed from a million dollars per app to like $50,000 per app, which really is making it a lot more interesting. So anyways, so these are, you know, this is the area that I'm going to focus on today. So let's talk about hybrid. So hybrid app, if you look, think about Apache Cordova, um, basically it's an open source framework for building cross-platform apps using HTML5. Okay, and Cordova, I'm, I'm assuming you all know what Cordova is. I'm still going to talk about it a little bit just because that's what I know the best, but Cordova is, it has kind of spearheaded the whole idea of cross-platform in an open way. Uh, started in 2008, so when you look at the, uh, the longevity of this, I, was, uh, I watched someone present at NC DevCon a few weeks ago, and they talked about you know, Cordova being like five or six years old. It's like, yeah, no, it's uh, eight years old. Started with iOS, they quickly added Android and BlackBerry. And then in 2011, they announced they were uh, donating the project to Apache Software Foundation. They first did it as Apache Callback, which was kind of interesting, that no one liked the name, so then they did it as Device Ready. And then finally, they changed the name to Cordova. Anyone know what Cordova is? The word Cordova, where it came from? Well, Nitobi uh, was actually located on Cordova Street in Vancouver. That's how the project got its name. Um, and very quickly after they donated to Apache, they sold, the Toby sold itself to Adobe. And I'm pretty sure the reason why they donated to Apache was because IBM and a lot of other vendors were involved in the project, and they wanted to make sure the project would live on under Adobe's stewardship. And so they forced it into Apache, and then the Toby went to Adobe. And then there's this expectation with Cordova that it will become obsolete over time as the mobile platforms add native capabilities to the browser. Now that's been the, the goal of a Cordova for as long as I can remember. Now I'm an old guy, but I still have good memory. Um, so the, the, what's interesting about this is there's an expectation to become obsolete because the browser vendors will catch up, but that hasn't happened. And the Cordova project has evolved dramatically over time to keep it in people's minds. So where uh, the, the browser vendors adding native capabilities, has happened, and not as fast as I think we expected, but things, then things like React Native and so on came along, and the Cordova team is working on pluggable web views, which allows you to plug in your own rendering engine for these apps, and therefore it's getting some longevity because you can pretty much do anything you want with Cordova, which is cool. Um, the smartphone industry is heavily involved in Cordova development, which is really freaking cool, except for Apple. But uh, you know, Adobe's got six or seven people. Um, IBM used to have about 10 people, but the staff is a little bit smaller now. Google was heavily involved, and the team shifted around a couple years ago. But it's, it's got heavy contribution from the smartphone community, which is another reason why it lives on today. Oh, and um, it's also the core of many commercial software products. So if you look at IBM Worklight, which is now called at Mobile First, um, the Salesforce mobile platform, Oracle's mobile platform, they all have Cordova under the covers. When I, was, when I was at SAP, I was product manager for their set of Cordova plugins. So not only is this mobile industry adopting Cordova, the um, commercial software vendors are doing it as well uh, in a big way. And so like Alpha Software is one of the cross-platform development platforms. There's a bunch of other ones, but they all have Cordova under the covers. So if you're thinking about doing an app with Cordova, recognize that there's a lot of people involved in it, and um, it's a pretty safe bet. So let's talk about how this works. Remember I said at the very beginning it's an open source framework for building cross-platform apps. Basically, for those of you that don't know Cordova, I'm sorry if I'm boring the people that do, you, you take a web app, 
So HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You run it through some sort of build process and out spits a native app. Okay? And what's important to note about this is that the web, con web, web content is simply rendered within a web view within the app. Okay, there's no transpiling or anything else happen. The data is, or the web app is not converted into native code or anything. It's a native app that basically opens up a browser window and renders your web content. The beauty of it is that once that web content's running in that native container, there's a JavaScript bridge that allows that web app to access native APIs. And that is the beauty of Apache Cordova. Uh, pretty much any web content, because it's a browser. On older devices, the web view was not always exactly the same as the browser on the device, which is why, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, that's no longer the case. So Apple used to lobotomize uh, the web view so that the browser was faster. They stopped doing that. Google used to have a separate rendering engine for the web view. They stopped that, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> and then you can basically have whatever rendering engine you want. And have you guys ever heard of cross uh, crosswalk? One hand. <clears throat> Two hands. You know, you're, you're just thinking. Oh, you're busy on the phone. Oh, you, okay, cool. By the way, I'm an abusive presenter. I, mean, I don't mean anything by it. I'm just having some fun. <laughs> but just don't get up and leave, because I'll thank you for leaving, or thank you for coming. Um, so Intel created a project called Crosswalk, which basically allows you to backport the Blink rendering engine to older versions of Android. So basically, on devices where, on, on Android devices where the web view is lobotomized, <clears throat> you can replace the engine with Chrome, basically, and then allow your web app to run more consistently across older devices, which is way cool. It's free. So what about supported HTML framework? So I get this question a lot. It's like, you know, can I use Framework X with Cordova, filling in X with whatever framework I want? Yeah, absolutely. There's no limitation because it's a web browser, so I can use whatever JavaScript framework I want. You don't believe me? Okay, you had that look like, no, wait a minute, I heard that... Platform X doesn't work with Cordova. It does. It all pretty much does. <laughs> and then there's even hybrid specific frameworks. The biggest one is Ionic. So there's companies that have put together specific frameworks designed just for hybrid apps. So Ionic gives you some pretty cool um, UI elements. Onsen UI does the same thing. So if you want to have a web app running in a native container that looks like a native UI, you can do that through these frameworks. Should you? That's a really good question. Uh, and you have to think very carefully about the app features, performance requirements, and so on. <clears throat> and that's actually how you're going to weigh Cordova versus the other approaches we'll talk about in a little bit. Very important point. What's next? Oh, architecture. So basically, again, you probably know this, but basically there's a bunch of web content, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, plus other stuff running inside a native app. And then there's a plugin architecture that gives that web app access to native capabilities. And then I can make whatever plugins I want to expose whatever native APIs I want to the web app. Is it a lot of it done for me? Not so much. But more and more developers are adding plugins, so it's pretty cool. From a tooling standpoint, uh, everything is shifted to the command line, which I'm assuming you guys know, but the Cordova command line allows you to manage application projects. Microsoft used to have something called Taco, the Taco CLI, which um, <clears throat> they've since killed the project. Um, but it was a, a, a superset, or wait, it was a, uh, a set of command line actions that talked to the Cordova API and other APIs, but um, that's gone. And then you basically use whatever tools you want to design and code your application. Um, what's really cool about it is you can, um, there are third party tools that are already aware of Cordova and PhoneGap and therefore allow you to. Um, use some pretty sophisticated tool for this process. But basically, you code the web app and using whatever text editor you want. <clears throat> the Cordova CLI makes calls out to the native SDKs to build applications and sign them and so on, even fire up emulators and whatever. And then away you go. Um, if you want, you can do Cordova development never going into the native SDK, uh, native uh, IDEs, um, but some people spend all their time in there. Just, it just kind of depends. <clears throat> There's a boatload of third-party tools. That's when we knew that Cordova was really taken off when the tool vendors started making an investment in them. So I mentioned Taco. Um, the Taco CLI is dead, but the Visual Studio tools for Apache Cordova is a very robust plugin for Visual Studio that allows you to <clears throat> create, manage, and build Cordova projects in Visual Studio 
How many people have heard of the Visual Studio Tools talk about? Okay. Are right, you guys sitting down? You ready? You guys already know this. It allows you to build, create and build and manage Cordova projects and do live JavaScript debugging on Windows applications, Android applications, and, and iOS applications, all from within Visual Studio. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. You install a node module on your, on your Mac, and from within Visual Studio, you set your breakpoints in your JavaScript code. You go, you pick iOS from the dropdown, you pick the simulator you, or simulator you want from the dropdown, click it, and it uh, kicks off the build tasks on iOS, launches the iOS simulator on the Mac, and then uh, connects the debuggers. And so you can, you can step through your JavaScript code on iOS from within Visual Studio. I don't know if you can tell I'm excited, but it's pretty cool. Intel's got a big team of developers, although that team, I think, is getting smaller. They built the XDK, where they took a bunch of tools and cobbled them together in a full hybrid development environment. Um, Eclipse Project, uh, the, the hybrid mobile, uh, is it Time, Thyme? I don't know how to pronounce it. <clears throat> but the folks at Red Hat created a uh, cross-platform IDE in Eclipse and released it as Eclipse Thyme. There's things like AppGyver, Gap Debug, and so on, which help um, with creating your applications and, and debugging them and so on. And then if you look at like Adobe Brackets, Dreamweaver, I use WebStorm as my IDE for web apps. They have full awareness of Cordova. So I can create a new Cordova project. Even um, NetBeans does now, too. So I go File New, Cordova Project, and all of these IDEs build a complete Cordova project, make calls out to the, um, the CLI to get stuff going, and then I have a full, robust environment. <clears throat> so I'm pretty sure we're mainstream. Can I put Cordova apps in the app stores? Absolutely, because it's a native app. And uh, Apple even doesn't care. There's also this thing called Adobe PhoneGap. You guys heard of Adobe PhoneGap? A lot of people, a lot of people use the two si um, to mean the same thing, and they're not. Okay, so PhoneGap was donated to Apache as Cordova. Adobe made a distribution of Cordova called PhoneGap. I know, it's confusing. And then they added a bunch of stuff to it. So PhoneGap is not Cordova. PhoneGap is a distribution of Cordova. So it's like Linux and Ubuntu, right? We have Linux, and Ubuntu is not Linux. Ubuntu is a distribution of Linux, OK? But it's really cool. They've added a PhoneGap build service, which is a cloud-based service for doing the build and compile. You might think you can get away without having a Macintosh if you're using that, but you can't. Um, Apple still requires you to have a Mac to create the signing keys to upload to the service. Uh, hydration allows you to actually do over-the-air content distribution. So if you modify your web app, you can deploy it to test devices without recompiling the code. Um, Microsoft has a push service for this. Uh, SAP has one. Uh, so that's not really that unique anymore. <clears throat> There's a PhoneGap developer app, which is in the, ga the app store. PhoneGap Enterprise is a app from Adobe that allows that product to interface with Adobe's cloud products. So the, um, the content management, um, the, content, the content cloud and so on, is an app for that. <clears throat> and then they also used to provide commercial support. I don't know if they still do or not, but it was a one way to get commercial support for Cordova. I'm sorry, PhoneGap. We good? All right. <clears throat> so I want, I want to give some examples of code to kind of tell the story of Cordova, and then I'll show you the same thing for, well, actually, I intended to show you some code for the other tools, but my laptop doesn't have a, the right connector, and, but we'll, we'll have fun anyways. So this is a simple web app. I hope you guys will all agree with me on that. Is that a Cordova app? Could be. If I package it into a native container using the Cordova tools, ta-da, Cordova app. Okay, but there's nothing Cordova-ish about this. <clears throat> Um, I have a more interesting version uh, that's loading Cordova.js. That's kind of cool. Uh, it's adding an event listener and it's doing some stuff. So basically, this line here adds Cordova capabilities to that web app. And then on body load adds an event listener for device ready. And with that in place, that device ready event fires when the Cordova container has finished initializing. So then after that point, I can make calls to any native API that Cordova supports, and I can go do what I want. Okay. What's interesting is you don't have to actually put this Cordova.js 
file in your project folder. It's done automatically by the tools. So that's how you make a Cordova app. And then to see, oh, yeah, the Cordova APIs. So <clears throat> the original set of APIs were created by the Cordova team. Interestingly, they were inconsistently implemented across platforms. So the camera API on iOS was different from the camera API on Android. Thank goodness they fixed that. So now you have a consistent API. And then um, they've migrated the APIs to W3C specifications where they became available. So like the Cordova file API, um, some of the other APIs in there, the uh, media API and so on are all based on open standards instead of anything proprietary they did. And then eventually, um, if the API exists within the platform, they'll basically pull their capabilities and just use what's in the browser. But basically, the, the APIs give you a wide range of capabilities to provide native access to your, your web app. Uh, there's basically a whole set of plugins. Uh, these are maintained by the Cordova team, but there's also a larger catalog of plugins maintained by the community. Facebook has them, Microsoft has a bunch. It's really cool. All right. So this is an app that does something. This is um, part of a simple web application. <clears throat> it's waiting for the Cordova app to initialize. And then within my JavaScript code, on my device ready, I can go in and replace the content with these are calls to the Cordova device API. So it's a call to a native API. But that's it. My web app looks like a web app. I'm calling some JavaScript APIs like I would do otherwise. To get an example of this, this is what it looks like. So these are, these are results of native APIs, but this is a web app. And then, for example, the camera API, I can add my plugin to the app using the command line tools or Visual Studio or whatever. I make a single call to an API, navigator.camera.getPicture, pass it some um, callback functions, pass it an options object, and it goes. And basically, my options object then describes how my, how the API, how the photo is going to be taken. It's important to know that des um, destination type, if you accept the default, by the way, it'll create a JavaScript object that, um, a JavaScript object of the image and every one of your mobile phones is going to crash when it tries to use it. Right? As soon as the camera um, number of megapixels went above like three, uh, the JavaScript engine could no longer handle an image as a JavaScript object, and the app crashes regularly. So when you try to use a camera API, you don't specify this, and it fails, don't email me, because I've already told you what's wrong. So then here's my web app. Um, this, is using, ah, this is using a JavaScript framework called Topcoat. From, uh, it's actually not JavaScript, it's CSS, uh, CSS framework from Adobe called Topcoat. I take a picture, it brings up the camera. I take my picture, decide if I want to save or discard. This is my office. And, uh, and then I, I can either return the photo as a URL, I can re return it as an object, which I don't want to do, or I can, um, yeah, that's basically it. All right, to install Cordova, it's very, very, very complicated. Are you ready? I open a terminal window, I execute npm install dash g Cordova. Done. If you're on a Mac and you use sudo, you're not paying attention. Um, I was going to show you this, but I can't. Um, but basically, I uh, use the command line Cordova create lunch menu. Ta-da, created a project. I'm done. I change directories to the lunch menu folder. I say Cordova platform add Android Windows, and then it pulls out a bunch of stuff. I create an Android project, a Windows project. If I was on a Mac, I could also add iOS, and it adds an iOS project. At that point, at that point, I know you guys can't see this, I apologize. Um, this is the project folder. There's a hooks folder, a platforms folder, a plugins folder, a www folder, and a config.xml. Config.xml contains configuration settings for the app. Um, hooks is for um, executing code during different parts of the CLI process. Platforms has a separate folder for each platform. I can go there and open the Android project in Android Studio. I can open the iOS project in Xcode. And then basically the www folder is where I edit all of my code. Index.html, CSS, JavaScript. All right, that's it. When I build this www folder, it's copied into each platform folder and then passed off to the SDKs for each platform to compile them. That's it. Questions? We're not done yet. Yes, sir? Yeah, 
So the question is, if you have an existing app and you want to package it in Cordova, would I make a separate repo for Cordova or keep it with the others? It depends. Is it built with dynamic technology like um, PHP or ASP.NET, something like that? It's just a web app. <clears throat> if it's static, you could just keep it in with everything else. I mean, you're going to um, add Cordova-specific JavaScript code, so you're going to have to have a mechanism for doing that. Um, and actually, there's um, you can add a, a folder called merges to this folder, and in that merges folder, put an Android folder, iOS folder, Windows folder, and in those folders, put platform-specific JavaScript files or CSS for each of those platforms, and those will automatically get copied into the appropriate folder during the build process. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, if I'm using TypeScript or something, how hard is it to implement? It's super easy. Use Gulp or Grunt or whatever, and just make Cordova call at the end of that process, and it works beautifully. Um, if, you, if you go to the, one of my book's websites, there's an example Grunt file and Gulp file that shows you how to do that. Um, the other option is to use the hooks folder and just put in a pre-compile hook that calls um, TypeScript compiler or whatever. Yeah, no, it's super easy. I get answers for everybody. All right. I'm running out of time. So uh, perceived problems is the web view is too slow. Uh, you can't have a native UI. Um, we know the web view is not slow anymore. It's been fixed by the platform vendors. I can, I can have a native UI. I'll show you how to do that in a few minutes. Um, and you can't have native controls in a hybrid app. That's not true either. So Adobe, or I'm sorry, the PhoneGap team is doing something called Cordova Ace, <clears throat> which allows you to build a Cordova app with a native UI. Interestingly enough, this project is being led by Microsoft, and they're doing Android and iOS first. It's a crazy world we live in. <laughs> um, hybrid has changed. So for years, developers wanted something better than a Cordova. They, um, they wanted a cross-platform framework to enable them to do more from a single code base. They want to use their web development skills, but they want native controls. Okay. So for the longest time until the Cordova Ace came out, the Cordova team couldn't help with that. That's all over. Um, so we have these cross-platform tools. I, I, I coined a phrase called JavaScript-driven native to describe this category of apps. Whether it takes or not, I don't care. But basically, with JavaScript-driven native, I've got a native mobile app with a native UI, but the app is coded almost entirely in JavaScript. And if you were at um, Jen Looper's session earlier, she showed native script, so I'm not going to go too detailed in that. Um, it doesn't rely upon the web views. It actually fires up a native, a native palette and then adds native controls to it. Now, I say here reasonable percentage of code reusable. Well, sort of. So for example, the native script folks claim that you get 100% code reuse across platforms. OK. Um, the React Native stuff, for example, they've got a completely different set of APIs for Android versus iOS. Can you go 100%? Ah, maybe, but you have to work really hard. So have an expectation that I can have 100% reuse of my business logic and have an expectation that I'm going to have a lower percentage for my UI. Now, there's abstraction layers like using XML to describe the, the UI, and then you get away from platform-specific APIs, but just have reasonable expectations. Um, most are free, but they're free, but. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So the first one I want to talk about is Accelerator Titanium. So Titanium is actually the old, the long in the tooth version of the cross-platform JavaScript tools, created in 2009. How many of you heard of Titanium? Yeah, OK. So these guys were early ones. They, um, they created a JavaScript framework that you could use to build a web app. I'm sorry, build a native app. And then it would make calls out to the native APIs to build the UI. And it was really cool because you could build games and so on. And you had, you had very well-performing native apps all coded entirely in JavaScript since 2009. Um, they were trying to be a commercial product. They tried multiple versions of, of free. Essentially, they pivoted and made it a cloud-based service for building mobile apps. And um, they released the Titanium stuff as uh, open source through the community. They got bought last year. And so I don't know how much focus there's going to be on what they're doing, but it's kind of cool. Um, you, you, they had an MVC framework that you could use to abstract away the UI stuff. So you got away from 
separate code per mobile platform. Um, you can throw up a web view and display content if you want to, but by default it doesn't use a web view. Um, pretty cool stuff. They also, f they also forked uh, Eclipse into something called Optana, and uh, they released that as their IDE. Um, another one is React Native. You guys have all heard of React Native, right? Do you think it's cool? Okay. Um, basically, Facebook's, in my mind, Facebook's plan to deliver a more consistent interface for, well, Facebook, right? Um, I, I haven't been following it incredibly closely, and maybe you guys know more than I do, but um, it's clear that they want to make something that they can use and then you know, get the community involved and so on, which is awesome. I just don't know how, how much attention it's going to get to, be, to fixing some of the cross-platform stuff. So when you create a React Native project, you get a separate Android folder and a separate iOS folder. And the last time I looked, which was like two weeks ago, the, um, there were separate UI APIs for Android versus iOS. I don't get that. I'm sorry. I just don't get that. If I'm building a cross-platform tool, I'm letting people code in JavaScript, I don't want to fill my code with if-thens, right, to so call separate APIs. I don't want to maintain a separate set of files for Android versus iOS. I just don't. But, but you know, we may be stuck with that. Not because of Facebook, just because how hard mobile is. Um, uh, the beauty of this is there's no strings attached. Facebook isn't trying to sell you anything. Okay, so Accelerator is, for example, but, but it's still free if you want it to be. The next one, oh, so creating an app. Um, very simple, if you guys haven't seen it, I go um, React Native init lunch menu, and it creates a whole project for Android and iOS together. So it's super easy to create a project. When you create the project, um, you can go React Native run iOS, or React Native run Android and execute the emulators and run it and so on. And I was going to show you the code, but I don't have my laptop, so we're not going to. But if you could see this, which I know you can't, um, you would see that the project, I can't even read this. Um, the project contains an Android folder, an iOS folder, a node modules folder, and then basically there is an index.ios um, JS index.android.js, and you just modify the code and go your merry way. Uh, there's a lot of people who know more about this than I do, and there's even sessions today about it, so I'm not going to go too far. The other one is native script from Telerik. Um, another one of those free butts. Um, it's, a free, it's a free open source framework with a, a growing community, but ultimately Telerik really wants to sell you their mobile platform, which is okay. If you don't want to use it, you don't have to. You can still build cool stuff. Um, the idea is that it's a JavaScript framework that you use to build native mobile apps. They claim 100% um, code com or code reuse across platforms. I don't believe them, but they can claim that all they want. Um, you can code in JavaScript or use TypeScript with Angular. And uh, the TypeScript with the Angular thing is interesting. Um, what they did was in Angular 2, they created native components for all of the UI elements you'll need for a mobile app. But they created them as Angular components. And then you just plunk the Angular components in your web app and uh, compile it, and it works. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, there we go. Um, same thing. I open up a terminal window. I say TNS, which is Teleric Native Script, create lunch menu. And it creates a folder with a bunch of stuff in it. And I just go to that folder, and I'm ready to go. If you could read this screen, uh, you would see there's a package.json, there's a platforms folder, there's a node modules folder, because it's all based on node, and at the top is an app folder. The app folder has app.js. It's where you define your models. It's where you define your, um, your controllers, all that stuff. But it's pure JavaScript. Uh, and it basically, like I said, all of these, they create a native UI, uh, all coded, all basically from JavaScript code. Um, app.js, there's an XML, so main page, that XML, which describes the UI of the page. Um, main page JS, which is the controller for that page, and so on. I, like I said, I was hoping to show you some code, but I, uh, I can't. And the last one is one that I'm assuming no one's ever heard of, Tabverse.js. Good, no one's heard of it. So there is value in this session at 430 on a first day of the conference. So Tabris is a very well, very unknown framework. Basically what they've done is they've built native UI extensions for Apache Cordova. 
So if you remember what I showed earlier, the a Cordova application framework, it's a native app with web code, and then there's a bunch of plugins between the web code and the native APIs. And so instead of exposing APIs through that plugin infrastructure, what Tabris has done is they've exposed UI elements. And so I create my project, I add the Corova plugins for their stuff to my project, and then I just make calls to the API to bring those UI components onto the screen. So it's a completely different approach than React Native, App Accelerator, and Native Script. So it's kind of cool. Like I said, no one's heard of these guys. They've been around for about three years that I know of. Um, there's no tooling at all. So they don't have an IDE. They don't have a, they actually have a build service, I think. They have a build service. <clears throat> um, so I don't know what's going to happen with them because, like I said, if not, no one in this room has heard of them but me, I'm not sure they're incredibly popular, but who knows? So, wow, not showing you code really uh, allowed me to get through 60 slides in 35 minutes. Um, anyway, so the, the point is that there's a lot of options available to you. The idea is, do I, do I want to build a native app? Do I need to build a native app? Or can I get by building a native app using my web skills? And I've spent a lot of time over the last five years kind of studying this problem. And so I, I get this question a lot. The question is, um, oh, I still have more content. Um, the question is, what do I need to accomplish? What does my performance need to be? What skills do I have? And then how much time and money do I have to deliver this app? And so if you ask me to tell you which is the best approach, I will always answer, it depends. So you have to assess each project based upon those requirements, and then pick your tool and go from there. OK, got it? Do you believe me? OK, cool, awesome. All right, next. So that was the JavaScript-driven native apps. There's another one that I call adjacent native apps. And the reason why I call it that is because they're native apps. They're coded in a native compiled language, but it's not the one that specifically targets the mobile platform. Um, there used to be two options. One was called Xamarin, the other was called RoboVM. And uh, this particular space has had a really interesting history over the last eight months. Um, you guys ever heard of Mono? Yeah, so they, they um, did an open source clone of the .NET framework. Well, the folks at Mono, um, about three years ago, started Xamarin. And the idea is that you build native apps using Mono, or .NET, depending how you look at it, in C Sharp. And then they provided a transpiler that, and I don't remember exactly how this works, but on Android, it compiles to a CLR, and then they've got a CLR runtime for Android, and then iOS, it compiles into something else, and they've got a different kind of runtime. But at the end of the day, I code my app in C Sharp, I make a call to relatively consistent API cross-platform, and I can have native apps for two different targets. Now, Xamarin, a year ago, was saying that you got 70% code reuse when you did that. And I'm assuming that 70% is mostly business logic, because they still have some UI inconsistencies in the APIs. Um, one, of our, one of our customers did some testing about a year ago, and they came up with a, with a number of 30%. So I'm not really sure which one to believe, but I know it's not 100, okay? So just be ready for that. Um, what they have done is they have abstracted some things away. But let me kind of finish the history. So, so the founders of Mono split from Novell. Remember Novell? <laughs> I was a Novell CNI. I used to teach Novell classes. Half these people don't even know what Novell is. Um, so they created Xamarin. Xamarin created this commercial offering, but they had a really hard time getting traction with customers because they were nobody. No one ever heard of them. And the price was reasonable, but that happened at the, at the time where people stopped being willing to pay for cross-platform mobile development tools, OK? So then Xamarin buys RoboVM, Microsoft buys Xamarin, Xamarin kills RoboVM, converts the development team to working on Xamarin development, and then Microsoft open sources everything. So literally, Microsoft bought Xamarin for no other reason than to open source all of it. Yes, you're not dreaming. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not a huge Microsoft fanboy. I, I mean, I know I'm working for them now, but it's only like two weeks old, so it hasn't had time to really take. But um, but having been in this industry for a really long time, 
to see this new Microsoft and see the investments Microsoft's making in the technology is really kind of mind-boggling. So honestly, and Microsoft will tell you this, they bought this and they open source all of it to drive cloud revenue. They figure if they deliver really robust um, capabilities for building cross-platform mobile applications using technologies you already know, it's going to help drive Azure, Azure um, revenue. Okay, so now we have it. It's really cool. Um, free, free, totally free. Um, what's interesting is um, Microsoft started bundling Xamarin in Visual Studio Community Edition, and then Xamarin Studio, if you guys know Xamarin, Xamarin Studio is actually going to become, wait for it, Visual Studio for Macintosh. I just said Visual Studio for Macintosh, didn't I? Interesting. Now, that is not information I learned in my two weeks at working for Microsoft. So don't go running back and say, this Microsoft guy said, no, it's, it was public. They announced it at TechEd, uh, whatever their tech conference is, eight months ago. All right, so you code your app in C Sharp. Uh, PFM happens. You guys know PFM? The older guys are laughing. OK. Um, native app, native performance, native UI. It's Android and iOS and uh, Windows. And then you can abstract away the UI using Xamarin Forms. You basically draw your UI in XAML. And then you code your business logic in C Sharp. You have your UI abstracted away in an XML file. And it all comes together. And then these are the platforms. You'll notice that I, I'm not such a fanboy that I always list iOS first, because that's just wrong. We do it alphabetically to make sure everyone's happy. All right. that is my whirlwind 41 minutes, 60 slides. What'd you think? Thank you. <clears throat> was, it, was it useful? Is there anything else you'd like to know? Because I have four minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, I, uh, the very first slide had the URL where they were. Uh, there's 60, so just give me a second. <laughs> Next. Wow, it's a lot further back than I wanted to go. Hang on. There's probably an easier way to do this, isn't there? Yes, sir, question. Go ahead. Shout it out. How do you see WebGL affecting the future of mobile development? How do I see OpenGL affecting the future? Yeah. WebGL or GL? I have no idea. Okay. I don't have an opinion. <laughs> All right, this is terrible. Did you guys hear his question? He said, would you recommend using PhoneGap instead of Cordova? On top of. Well, there's no on top of. PhoneGap is Cordova. Wow, there it is. The slides are right there. Um, so PhoneGap matters if you want to build in the cloud, because Cordova doesn't have a cloud build service. So if you want to have a single infrastructure where developers upload their code and you get your builds out with a consistent signing and so on, PhoneGap builds a great way to do it. It's like $9.95 a month or something. Um, PhoneGap developer app is a great way to, to test your apps while you're developing. But there's absolutely no difference in the client code at all between the two. They used to have a different CLI, which was mind-boggling. Um, they've since fixed that. So nothing. Yes, sir. Yeah. What do you think of Ionic? Oh, Ionic. Oh, Ionic's cool. Um, Ionic quickly went from 0 to 60 miles per hour on the, the um, the UI side of Cordova. One of the biggest questions, and I'll get whoever else had a question here, I promise. Um, one of the first questions you get is, you know, what UI framework does, like what UI capabilities does Cordova provide? None. What UI framework should I use? It doesn't matter. To what should I use? Ionic. So Ionic's created a CLI that makes calls in the Cordova CLI, and they've created this really cool UI, and they're really working hard on it. I think it's like two guys in a hamster in a room somewhere with Mountain Dew. <laughs> I really do, but. Um, the industry, so IBM has made a big investment in documenting how to use Ionic with uh, mobile first, which is Cordova. Um, Microsoft, I think, is doing some tooling. Again, I'm just thinking, only there are two weeks. I think they're looking at it as well. So no, Ionic is a really good choice. Monaca is the company. Um, PhoneGap Day, PhoneGap Day was in Utah last year. The guy from Monaca that was doing, no, that's not, sorry. Monaca is Onsen UI. Um, the guys from Ionic and the guys from Monaco were all at PhoneGap Day talking about what they're doing, and it's really, truly beautiful. Yes, sir? I was just going to say that Ionic is bigger now because they're doing it with the way that they do the hybrid. Okay, did you guys hear that? All right, next question.
Good question. Do you guys hear that? Is it, does the WebView have any gotchas, and do they have issues with the, the, origin, the origin policy and so on? Yeah, they do. Um, it used to be that the Cordova app was wide open and could go anywhere. And they got a lot of grief for it, so they actually added a whitelist plugin that gives you fine-grained control over at the native level what you can access. Um, yeah, well, you can you can um, specify different hosts and different access for the different hosts. But like I said it's, it's not it's not applied at the browser level; it's applied at the native app level, which is what they needed to do. Um, however, if you do basic auth from the web view, and authentication fails the failure message does not bubble up to the Cordova UI. And that's kind of a nightmare. And so we, when I was at SAP, we created a plugin for that. Because otherwise, you, you would not know that the authentication failed. Which, if you're building enterprise apps, that's a problem. But, pardon me? Yeah. yeah, you wouldn't know. Yeah, well, and Cordova didn't want to fix it because they would have had to really hack at the security layer to fix that. And they just left it to third parties to fix it. Yes, sir? I, I can't. I can't answer that one. I mean, you're, you have to make an investment because just because I'm telling you these tools are cool doesn't mean I'm not a liar. Um, no, seriously. I mean, you know, what's easy for me might be hard for you and vice versa. You have, to, you have to see how the tooling fits in your development infrastructure. You have to see how it fits with the CI and everything else you're doing. You got to see what's hard and what's easy. And, and you got to see if, you can, if, you're, if the developers you have can deliver the UI and performance you want. Sorry, I'm dodging that one, I know, but I'd be lying if I said anything else. And I'm not a sales guy. So if I'm a sales guy, oh, yeah, no, it's easy. Just, you pick Ionic. No, just can't do it. Anything else? Yes, sir. Ma'am, sorry. No, can't tell. Ooh, the... Man, sir. That's a good question. And the changes to the web, you haven't fixed that because you still have the native app that's initializing. And uh, there's all these abstraction layers in for the plugins and so on. It takes time. Um, there are things you can do to help speed it up. So um, what a lot of people recommend is you load an index.html that immediately loads another page. And that way, when that gets up, it doesn't take time to render before it tries to load something else up. Um, there's also minifying stuff and so on, which doesn't have as big of an impact as you'd expect. So minifying helps, but it doesn't help a lot. And so what you do is you abstract away all of the, the code that takes some time to start up within your app, and you get some sort of UI in front of the users before you, you kind of branch off to that other stuff. So the whole thing about moving JavaScript libraries to the bottom, for example, you actually move it to a separate file. So at least you get some sort of UI. Another way you can fix the perception of that is Cordova added a um, splash screen plugin that at least gives you some sort of UI before uh, anything else pops up. My, my apologies. Yeah, but don't forget Ionic is loading Angular, and there's a whole bunch of stuff coming up. So you have to, you have to think about your build process. You have to think about the way your app is crafted to minimize the impact of that. But at the end of the day, it's still the browser loading JavaScript files and CSS files. So good luck. Yeah, and we're out of time, by the way, so we're actually technically late. Go ahead. I'll answer the question. Go ahead. Well, people saying. Thanks, guys.